Grand Lake Stream is a plantation in Washington County, Maine. When the 2010 census was taken, the population was 109. The town is named after the stream that flows through the town, which is known for its excellent landlocked salmon fishery and a fishing tradition that dates back to the middle of the 19th century. Little boy was fast asleep Out cold in the back seat Car pulled in about midnight When a million stars shone bright Boy wakes up, smells the pine Fooling with a fishing line He'll never be the same again His whole life changed right then When everything was green and blue And everybody smiled at you And Daddy, can we stay a few more days? I never want to leave One road out Magic things to dream about That little heart can't seem To say goodbye to Grand Lake Stream Grown man Growing boy Giving him his greatest joy Listen to the crying loon Beneath that silver moon And everything is green and blue And everybody smiles at you And son, I think we'll stay a few more days I never want to leave this place With one road in and one road out A different life to dream about That grown-up heart can't see To say goodbye to grass Old man, he's moving slow Wife knows the way to go He's fooling with a fishing line Until he smells that pine And everything is green and blue And everybody smiles at you Hoping he can stay a few more days She knows he'll never leave this place With one road in and no way out It's all he ever dreamed about That man could never see I know the first time that we came here, my husband and I came to fish, and we stayed in one of the camps right on the stream. And as soon as I walked into the cabin that we were going to stay in, that was it. 
I made up my mind right then and there, I'm going to live here. And my husband felt the same way. So after that, we just started coming year after year. And then we bought a little trailer. And that was our summer place we could go to whenever we wanted, even in the winter time. So we just spent more and more time here as time went on. And then um, I got laid off from my job and other things happened. And we decided if we're not going to move now, we're never going to move. So we left New Jersey and lived in our trailer for a couple years. And then um, just being in town, we found a regular house in town. And so we moved up to up by the dam. We live up there. And uh, it, ever since the first time we were here, it, it's been home. And this is where I want to be. And my husband felt the same way, so here we are. Well, here I am. He's passed away. Um, but, yeah. But he always wanted to be here. Like, this was his life. He was a fisherman, stream fisherman, bass fisherman, he, ice, anything. You name it, he was out there doing it. So, um, you know, we just, we fit in really well here. Even the people you don't like, you do like, and it's just perfect. In a town this size, there's no place to hide. Everywhere you go, you meet someone you know. You can't steal a kiss in a place like this. How the rumors do fly in a town this size. In a smoky bar In the back seat of your car In your own little house Someone's sure to find you out What you do and what you think What you eat and what you drink If you smoke a cigarette They'll be talking about your breath In a town Besides, there's no place to hide Everywhere you go You meet someone you know You can't steal a kiss In a place like this How the rumors do fly In a town this size How the rumors do fly 
in a town this size in a town this size in a town this size I started remembering more when we got to the fish hatchery house when, when Dad took uh, the job at the fish hatchery. And uh, we lived right beside the school, so uh, got to play on the school grounds and then play on the baseball diamond. But uh, I went to school here for six years before I went to Woodland. So, and I had my mom teach me for two or three years, which was a little strange, you know. Being mom, I know my brother would walk over with her and he said one time he says mom and uh, he always had to stop calling her mom when he got to the walkway that went into the school and then he says mom he says I like you but he says sometimes Mrs. Callaghan I don't like <laughs> <laughs> he had her a little longer than I did so uh, yeah we had uh, classes here in uh, in one of the rooms and it was uh, one through uh, fourth grade and then fifth through eighth grade, but uh, I didn't make it through the eighth. I went to junior high in Woodland. And uh, so that's about 64, I guess, that I went to Woodland. And uh, things were different then. But uh, it was great growing up here. And the kids were really uh, all friendly with each other and hang around with each other because we went to school and you're all in the same classroom. It was just everything you did together, you know. So it was great growing up as a group like that, so we were all pretty close. What kind of things did you do after school? Oh, wow. Well, this, in Grand Lake, it's almost like summer camp year-round up here. Is I mean, you just, all the opportunities to do anything and everything you wanted to do. I mean, we, we probably wore our bathing suit all summer long, rode bikes on it, played baseball, went swimming. You just went from one thing to the other. I mean, it was a great place to grow up. You got the opportunity to do the fishing and the hunting and uh, snowmobiling, skiing. I can remember when uh, we'd jump on our sleds and up on uh, top of uh, Weatherby Hill there and uh, could go all the way right down the main road, slide with your sleds, you know, and we uh, had a lot of fun doing that and building forts and stuff like that. So. And the, and the kids in Grand Lake were, were always pretty tight. Sure. I'm Jimmy Williams. I'm the son of Ralph and Ruthie Williams. Uh, I was not born here, but I grew, grew up here from like the time I was three days old <laughs> and went to school here. Grew up here, worked at Weatherby's, had a whole career there and stuff. But uh, growing up, it was great. I grew up with a great bunch of friends. It was Peter Yates, Pam Yates, and Calvin Brown, Frankie Bagley, Bernie and Chicky Kelligan, Susan Wheaton, Sally Ann Nason. Um, and that's what really bonds me to this town is the friends you grow up with and just being in the town. Uh, a lot of the things that I remember is being outside all the time, whether it was summer, spring, winter, or fall, and playing. Uh, one of the things that's dear to me and having all those friends and I always get a kick of and make a reference to is um, I grew up here, had a wonderful life, and a lot of it was because I had so many mothers. All of us kids growing up, our mothers had a network that was unbelievable. And we would be out of the house from basically daylight to dark and beyond. But our mothers always knew <laughs> what we were up to, what we were doing, what we had done. Uh, their network was great. And I can remember, too, getting caught in a few things where maybe we weren't supposed to be doing. And if one mother caught us, we all got the same treatment. <laughs> so there was no, <laughs> wait, you know, you better go home, I'm telling your mother X. We got the treatment, and then they told their mother, too, and we got it again. And, and that was, you know, that's very beneficial because you basically learn, start learning values that way. You know, actions takes consequences. And you start learning it early on here in Grand Lake. Some of the other of my favorite memories here is right here in this little schoolhouse. That's where I started from kindergarten all the way to sixth grade before we got sent to Woodland. Uh, and then, uh, you know, down here in this little gym, this used to be a gym. And uh, 
my favorite teacher of all time, Mrs. Kelligan, would have us down there and she taught us how to play basketball down here. We learned how to do the Virginia Reel down here. And it was funny because you look at a bunch of kids and stuff around here, we didn't all even girls to boys and all that stuff. Some of us who were the younger ones, Chicky Kelligan and myself, sometimes had to be over on the girls' side to play do the Virginia Reel. But that again, there's all lessons learned. You learn how to play together, how to get along together, and do all those different things. <laughs>
and she had uh, five kids, and and uh, some of them are gone now, but for the most part, most of them are still just carrying on, just like me, and and uh, and w for whatever it might amount to, in ten more days, I'll be eighty-six, and I feel like a million bucks. I quit smoking, drinking, and everything, Good. except eating. <laughs> but anyway, I feel great. I, I feel I feel like I, I do. I work every day, but. My name's Elaine Berger. I used to be Elaine Nason when I was a child. I grew up here. I was born here. I currently reside in my grandmother's house, which is now my house. And I love Grand Lake Stream. I moved away for 25 years, but you know what? There's no place like home. And when you come into this town, there's nothing but charm and loveliness. <laughs> my name is Nancy Betts. My husband and I, get, my husband Gary and I, uh, vacationed here in 1966. Uh, we stayed at a sporting camp and returned for seven years before we were fortunate enough to be able to buy the camps. And we've been here ever since. And uh, it's a wonderful place, and we've never regretted moving out of New Jersey. Welcome to the Grand Lake Stream Historic Museum. Uh, this building dates back to 1871 when Billy and Julia Brown owned it. And that was during the time of the tannery, which existed down by the hatchery. Uh, at that time, there were upwards of 600 people that lived in this town at the tannery working in the woods to provide the hemlock bark that was used in the tanning process. Uh, this room that we're in was added on to by the former owners, uh, the Kellys, uh, prior to our purchasing it. But the rest of the building dates back to 1871. This beautiful organ was donated by Barbara Wheaton's family, and according to our organist, Elaine, it's still, you can attest to the fact that it still works well. It works great. Walter Elliott was the founding president of the Grand Lake Stream Historical Society um, back in 1986, I believe. And he was an amateur archaeologist, so we have um, quite a few pieces that he uh, collected, as well as some petroglyphs that were found along the, the uh, banks of Grand Lake Stream. This is a copy of an original painting that was done by J.H. Rose, uh, the original owner of what was Colonial Sportsman Lodge. Uh, we sell these as a fundraiser, um, and we have a limited number of copies. We started out with 50, and I believe we're down to about 20. Uh, the painting was done in 1886. These pictures are of William and Julia Brown, the former owners, the original owners of this homestead. Uh, William Brown, known as Billy, had dairy cows and sold milk and butter. Uh, Julia Brown was a midwife and uh, she would go around town with her little black bag and the kids soon learned that she would deliver babies. So they'd ask her, Mrs. Brown, do you have a baby in that bag? Back in the late 1800s, according to Minnie Atkinson's book, the world's largest tannery existed where the hatchery is now. At that time, men would go work the woods and stay at lumber camps, featured in the lower right picture. Um, they would stay there for weeks or months at times, um, leaving their women back at home to fend for themselves pretty much. Uh, they would stay in rustic camps and there would be a camp cook that would provide meals for them. Uh, the picture to the left of that is of a pile of hemlock bark which was used in the tanning process. Um, to the left of that picture is a picture of the Shaw Brothers tannery chimney that remained after the fire. Uh, the, the tannery burned twice actually and then it actually went bankrupt and that was the end of the tannery. 
At that point, uh, the boarding houses that housed a lot of the tannery workers became what are now known as the sporting camps. Before the advent of the square stern canoe, uh, double enders were hauled up lake by steamboats and the sports and their guide would go up lake they would get into the double ender canoes and be guided during the day. At the end of the day, the guide would either paddle back or be brought back by the uh, steamboats. Uh, there were quite a few steamboats that worked the waters of Big Lake and Grand Lake, and when they were done with them, uh, quite often they were burned and the remains of them are still in the, uh, the lake. The picture up to the left shows the U.S. fish hatchery in 1877. It was the second U.S. fish hatchery at that time. We have several collections of arrowheads. Uh, this collection was uh, collected by Steve Fair, who owned a camp on Grand Lake Stream. This collection was donated to us by the Perry family, who have a camp up on West Grand Lake. Sonny Sprague was a well-known guide in Grand Lake Stream and his family donated this collection that Sonny collected. I mentioned earlier that Walter Elliott was an amateur archaeologist. These are castings of petroglyphs that he took um, that he found along the banks of Grand Lake Stream. And these are some of the dolls that our lady from Grand Lake Stream, actually from Auckland originally, made and uh, she used to take people that she knew and make these dolls in their portraits. This is a folk art drawing that was done by John Martin, the accountant for the Shaw Brothers Tannery. It was done back in 1882. We learned of its existence through a letter that we received from a lady who was doing an article on a buffalo hide tannery over in Burlington. Uh, she sent a very tiny picture of what she thought might have been the location of the tannery in Burlington. Um, one of our members, Audrey Ammerman, blew that picture up on her computer to a picture about the size of maybe 12 by 14, and we could clearly see that it was of Grand Lake Stream. The original exists at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. We were able to get permission from them uh, to have a digital file, buy a digital file, and have this very large uh, reproduction of that print. Um, had it not been for the lady's letter and the little picture, we never would have known this existed, and it's a real treasure. A unique family compound on Sisladopsis Lake, just west of Grand Lake Stream, is called the Dopsy Club. It was founded by the grandfather of a prominent Massachusetts businessman, Henry S. Dennison. It gained national recognition between the world wars through the work of one of Maine's greatest outdoor writers, Edmund Ware Smith, who was Dennison's son-in-law. Family members of Henry Dennison have set up this wonderful display of items from the Dopsy Club. One of note is the Old Come and Get It, which was featured in Edmund Ware Smith's books. Uh, apparently that became a very popular item in each of the, of the um, books. So we're fortunate to have that here on display. In 1891, there was a land scam called Lake and Wild. Um, a, a lawyer from New York, we believe, set up this whole scheme to sell all these lots to people, about $100, I think, a lot. And um, it's all on swampy horrible land for building anything and he, ex he sold it as if this was going to be this enormous beautiful community and he even put himself down as the justice of peace of Lake and Wild and uh, a few years ago some people were going through uh, stuff from their parents or grandparents or whatever and they found a deed and they thought maybe that it was valid of course it wasn't but they <laughs> sent it to us and we have it right here and it was marked in March 12th 1892 but it was a big scam for the area. 
Uh, back in 1944 and 45, prison, German prisoners of war were housed in dormitory-style buildings in Princeton, uh, which is now Indian Township. These were originally CCC buildings that were converted into housing for these prisoners. Um, they were brought to the woods during the day to work in the woods since the men were off at war. And we've learned that there were prisoner of war camps throughout our country in almost every state um, filling in for the men that were away. Uh, if you drive through Indian Township on Route 1, these two markers show the location of where the camps were. At the end of the war, we, they received a letter uh, from the prisoners, um, grateful that they had been treated so well. And there's a copy of that letter on the wall there. This counter was uh, from the Sutherland store, which was a two-story two uh, store across from where the Pine Tree store is now. The cash register was actually from Furbish's general store in Princeton. The waffle iron um, is a, a design similar to today's electric waffle irons. It would have been put on a wood stove. Uh, heated up, the batter would be poured into there, the lid closed, and when it had cooked for a little while on that side, you would flip it to this side. The drawer was used for the cash, and as you pulled it out, a little bell went off, which I assume alerted the storekeeper uh, if someone was in the drawer that didn't belong there. They didn't have buttons to push to tell you how much change to give back, so they had to figure it out themselves with these well-worn little um, compartments, and the bills would have been kept down here. Minnie Atkinson lives, lived in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Uh, she would spend her summers in Grand Lake Stream with her uncle. And during that time in the uh, early 1900s, well, around 1929, she wrote a book called Hinkley Township or Grand Lake Stream Plantation. Um, it's a good history of the town, and we do sell copies of it. And over here we have Buffalo Bob Smith and Ted Williams, a wonderful baseball star, and Howdy Doody, of course. Now, Buffalo Bob and Howdy Doody were great friends, as we all know. And uh, Mr. Smith used to play the organ in our church sometimes, and uh, Ted Williams was very popular with people in this town, especially the ladies. But uh, we were very honored to have both of them. They were very nice people. Harry Merritt was a professor emeritus uh, from the College of Architecture at the University of Florida. He came on board as, when we purchased the uh, Brown Homestead and helped us convert the homestead into a beautiful museum. When he, we outgrew the barn and needed uh, more space for our canoes, Harry um, donated all his time to um, come up with this beautiful guides gallery. He said we had to highlight the guides of Grand Lake Stream and their heritage. So thank you to Harry Merritt. We have some of our wonderful guides who are now no longer with us. We'll be fishing in the back. Anyway, we've got Carla up there in the left. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have Ralph Beach, Preston MacArthur. We have uh, Bill White. You got the mic. Oh, jeez. That was Valmore up there. I'm sorry. And then we have over here, I can't see, very good. Bill Sprague, Jack McKelvey, Leslie Brown, the father of the person who is now taking these pictures, Eddie Chambers, Earl Bonus, Ralph Williams, Walter Brown, and uh, Chester White, Bill White, my grandfather, Horace White, Carter White, Sonny Sprague, Paul Hoare, who owned the Pine Tree Store. And over here we have Louis Cotello. Woody Wheaton was born and raised in Grand Lake Stream. Uh, he went on to guide up on East Grand Lake where two of his sons had sporting camps. 
This is a wonderful representative um, example of a working guide's canoe with the bait bucket, the old tackle box, and all that went with it. Uh, on the center seat is a, a picture of Woody. Uh, here on this wall are featured uh, old motors that were donated to us. Frankly, I don't know a lot about them. That's when we like one of our male board, board members to be here. And our far left we have Alva Harriman, who was my neighbor, Randy McCabe, Lewis Brown, Frank MacArthur, Frank Allen, and Jim Cochran. And then we get down here with Timmy Bacon, and Carlton Yates, Woody Wheaton, whose canoe you saw a little while ago, Richard Brown, Ollie White, Gerald Holmes, and Joel Fawcett, who used to write articles for Fisherman magazines. And then we have Eddie Brown and Eddie Brown Jr., Kenny Wheaton, who made beautiful canoes, my great-grandfather, Arthur Wheaton, who is uh, Woody Wheaton's father, Raymond Spray, Ben Chambers, and George Brown, Llewellyn Bagley, Don Howe, and Charles Kelligan, who was also my neighbor at one point in time, Hazen Bagley, Stubby Yates, Harold Yates, we also called Red Yates, Pat Kelligan, Carol Gould, and Jimmy Gould. We have Harry Bailey, Georgie Bagley, Billy Whitaker, Don Chambers, Frankie Chambers, and Stephen Sprague. This is an aerial picture of Grand Lake Stream before the um, roof was put on the hatchery. The picture dates back to about 1929. You can see the Sutherland store across from the Pine Tree store. Um, and then this is a picture of John Bertinelli's Grand Laker going around the base of the Statue of Liberty. This is a mold of a double ender uh, made by Herbert Beaver Bacon, who was the originator of the square stern Grand Lake canoe. Uh, this is a Possumacote birch bark canoe that was built in 1877. Uh, one of our local residents knew of its existence. Uh, friends of, of his owned it down in Robinston. He approached them about our museum and they were kind enough to donate it to us. Bob Upham was a well-known fly tire and kind of the grandmaster of the stream. Um, he befriended a lot of people over the years, and a lot of these flies have stories, some of which they could tell and some not. But a, a group of his friends got together and had them framed for us, so it makes a wonderful display for our museum. And his wife, Jimmy Upham, named most all of these oh, flies. Oh, did she? Yes, she I did. didn't know that. She came up with the names for them. Ursa was hit by a car in Moosehorn Wildlife Refuge and killed. Um, a friend of our society called to see if we would like a bear for a display. He took it upon himself to take her to a local bear hunter who took care of skinning her and sending her to a taxidermist up in Portage, Maine. When we picked her up, we realized what a beauty she was and decided she needed a name. So through our newsletter, we had a bear naming contest. And the winning name, after a hundred and some entries, was Ursa, Latin for bear. Bob Upham was the winner. The birds that you see in the background were donated to us by a lady in town whose lawyer told her that it was illegal for her to own them. So we got permission from a local warden to acquire the birds and uh, also made a call to Augusta. And when I explained to the lady that I spoke with in Augusta that they were probably done back in the early 1900s, she said, whatever you do, make sure that they're under glass because back then they were treated with arsenic to preserve them. So we have a representative of a loon an immature bald eagle, and two great horned owls. There's also one of a kingfisher on the top of the case. 
These are some household items that would have been used in the laundry. There's a wash tub, uh, there's a ringer, and also these other boards that would have been used, and an old mangle ironing machine. I remember my mother having one of them, and she could actually do my dad's dress shirts on them. As it scans over here, you'll see an apple cider press, and then the um, the area that we all came to know at the post office where our postmistress, Danielle, used to work. Okay. Uh, this is a, a blueberry winnow. It was used by putting the blueberries in here and then you cranking the crank there. Uh, it would separate the blueberries from the leaves and from the sticks. And when Elaine Brown was our president, she remembered having a gentleman that she took through the museum. And when they came to this, uh, she explained how when you crank the wheel, the blueberries would come out there. And he said, I know all about that. He said, my school clothes used to come out there because a lot of people in this area back then especially used to work the blueberry fields to make extra money. Over here we have the stanchions that were used for the dairy cows that Mr. Brown had. Um, and he would actually, once he had them in their stalls, he would uh, pull these boards that you can't see, but there are some boards here, he would pull out and he would be able to pull his cart underneath this area to haul the manure out. The metal uh, cans that you see were actually used by the hatchery to transport fish. There's a steam box here that was used to steam the ribs for the canoes. They would put the wood in there and steam and it would make them pliable enough to be able to uh, bend. And last is this cowhide sleeping bag that was in the Passamaquoddy canoe when we acquired it. Uh, on this wall of the barn are some tools that were used for cutting lake ice. Back years ago, before refrigeration, people would cut the ice and store it in ice houses with layers of sawdust. The saw at the top would have been used to saw it, and then the tongs would have been used to carry it. Nowadays, they use chainsaws and snowmobiles to move the lake ice in places where people still store ice. The bobsled runners that you see here would have been pulled behind, uh, from behind a horse carrying the lumber and the bark to the destination. And through those bobsled runners you can see that enormous saw on the back wall. It was obviously a two-man saw and that's back when we had really big trees, <laughs> which we don't have many now. And here we have our Grand Lake Stream fire engine of 1889. When the gentlemen were all lumberjacks, were all in the woods cutting the trees down and everything, and the ladies were all left at home doing all the normal things. If there was a fire that broke out, this is what the ladies used to put them out. On this wall you'll see some of the tools that were used in the tannery for scraping hides. We also have a few pieces of hemlock bark and uh, tanned hides that were recovered from the stream, I believe. As you scan that table, you'll see a bowling pin that was from the bowling alley that was, I mean, yeah, the bowling alley that was along the canal, yeah. Elaine? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then tools that were used to determine the amount of wood in a tree. Um, a shoemaker's uh, model there and some other various items. One of our favorite stories is of one of the cows that Mr. Brown had as he was leaving the, leading them into the barn to go to their stalls. One of them decided to go up this set of stairs and in doing so got wedged. So Mr. Brown had to pull while his wife somehow got above the cow and pushed and they were able to free her. Um, our guess is that he probably sold her soon after. And now you've seen, we've closed in the door on our little tour here, just, and we've just seen some of the many, many highlights of this wonderful historical society. Thank you so much for joining us on this tour. We hope to see you on a future visit in person. Thank you.
my earliest memories. Well, I'm Kenny Sprague, and as Morris knows, I'm a real live Grand Laker, and I'm damn proud of it. And there's a lot of people say they're Grand Lakers, but I let them know right away that they're wannabes. <laughs> so I love Grand Lake, and I, I remember growing up here, there were so many of us kids. I mean, we were everywhere, and we played baseball and basketball, and we lived up to the dam and learned to swim off the wharf up there. And we leave leave our homes in the morning, and uh, we didn't get back till supper time. I don't know if we drowned or not. Nobody would know it. <laughs> and Holly Fitch had a little can little store up there. He'd sell candy bars and things. And his wife's name was Helena. And all us kids would wallow over there with our wet bathing suits on. We learned to swim. We lived up there, and it was just great. And Grand Lake had good people. And the old time old timers were even better. Leslie Brown and my father and my grandfather, they, they, they were the old timers then, not me. And they, they treated us well, and we had a lot of fun, and it was just a great town. They just loved it. You couldn't, you couldn't go wrong. There was no such, as, such a thing as people robbing people or fighting or things going wrong. It was just one happy family. And it always has been for me, you know? Now, I, I know that you stayed in Grand Lake. You didn't have to. So you made that conscious decision to stay here. What is so special about Grand Lake that made you want to stay as an adult and live your life here? Well, the, the thing is with Grand Lake, Morris knows, uh, once you got out of school, we were all poor kids. The whole town was poor. But nobody knew it because we all paddled the same canoe. We didn't know we were poor. And we, you know, we had clothes and food and everything like that. But once we got out of high school, and at least in my home, there was no such thing as further education. And my father always kept at me, why don't you try to be a state police? Uh, you got to join the service or something. So in order to survive, most of us joined the military. And, uh, but after I was in the military for a few years, and in a, a couple of years in Vietnam, I decided that wasn't, that wasn't for me. <laughs> so I, come, I came back, I came back to the States, and I always dreamed of coming back to Grand Lake, and I'd always tell my grandfather, Pat Sprague, I'll be back someday. And he, he'd say to me, yeah, and I've heard the birdies sing. What he meant by that, I never figured out. <laughs> he didn't think I would come back. But after a few years, I was living in Massachusetts, and I was doing really well. And uh, I just got it in my head I wanted to move back home. I couldn't stand it any longer. So I've been home for about 40 years now, and I won't leave unless they take me in a casket. <laughs> so I just love it here. It's the natural beauty of the town. Most of the people are friendly, and when we were growing up, they all were. You know, we had the lakes and the stream, and I was, I was a, just like Johnny Brown, Morris's father. I was a vicious trout fisherman. And I could always go get a bunch of trout. And I loved that. And I hunted. Me and my father were the biggest criminals in town. <laughs> and, and loved hunting. And, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just my world. And it still is. I have no intentions of going anywhere. So I just love Grand Lake to have a good time all the time, you know? Yep. Uh, kids, uh, w way back uh, way back when I was just about 10 or 15 years old, uh, Billy Sprague, all of, the, all of the Yates kids and all this that was big enough to walk, uh, to give myself something to enjoy, we used to cut switches pretty good sized switches at apple ripen time and stick an apple on the end of them switches and kill the cherry peckers that were setting out on the damn railing up there. I don't know how many we killed, but, but we got caught at it anyway. And I, I thought we were all gonna go to prison, but we didn't. But, but anyway, it was things like that. And we tied ropes on the damn railing uh, 
you couldn't dive off the dam, you'd kill yourself. But we used to tie ropes on the railing and then go, and then go down and and swim out and get a hold of the rope and let it get get you down into the white water and then you could just drift on the white water. Yeah, headed down toward the bridge, you know. And it, it was little things like that that I, I remembered for, I will forever, I guess. And, uh, well, Billy, of course, we had Labor Day down to Woodland. That was a big special thing, you know, Labor Day. And and Billy and, and Earl and all the Sprague kids would come down and stay with my grandmother or my mother and father and and, and stay there for three or four days during during carnival time. And we I got a I I, I probably shouldn't, but is Billy Sprague coming? Kenny Sprague. Huh? Kenny Sprague's coming. Well Kenny, well yeah, well Billy is um, <laughs> is the one that I was going to single out if I dared to. Is during the carnival time down to Woodland one time, Billy was staying with me down to Woodland and my mother and father. And we was down uh, walking down over what we call Black Hill in Woodland and to go up to the fairground. So we, you know, just walking along, just talking, and and uh, finally he said to me, he says, what's that faucet on that tree for? I said, that's where the carnival people water their animals, the horses and cows and whatever else they got with them. He said, you're kidding. I said, no. He says, can you drink it? No, I said, I wouldn't. It's coming right out of the river right over here, you know. And he says, oh, Jesus. Then he says, oh, I'll tell you something. He went over, and this is the gospel of God's honest truth. He tried to pee up that faucet, and he peed right in his own face. <laughs> and I've laughed over 10 years over that. And, <laughs> and I told everybody that I come to, you know. And, and that is the truth. And I was hoping that he might show up so I could raise him again. But but anyway, that's that's probably the dirtiest story I can tell. What about guiding? You're you're a guide. Oh, I guided for yeah. I guided till I was old enough to. I guided when I was old enough to get a license, which I did, and I got a. I got all of that stuff at home. I kept it, and I I guided uh, well out of Princeton, uh, Grand Lake mostly, but Princeton and some down at the mill. Some of the boys down at the mill knew that I was a registered guide, and so people that were coming in, salesmen and stuff like that at the mill, on occasion. They'd call me and ask me if I could take them fishing, you know, and 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 I could, and usually at the the, the club down the woodland right there in front of the mill, there was the clubhouse where they had suppers and meals and and then they used to pack my lunches up and man, what a lunch that I got from them, but. I got people from everywhere, you know, and and I I got so I loved it. I I did. Now I'm just too damn. I can't do it. I can't. I just can't do it. Too much. Are you much of a fisherman yourself? Pardon? Are you a fisherman too? Yeah, yeah, fishing and hunting. Uh, that's been a, a good part of my game all my growing up life, and I. I was a notorious bandito. I almost got caught too, uh, Jack and Deer, and and in a corner in the house one night, and she says, "I'm going to beat your ass to death if you don't stop this goddamn poaching." And that put the fear of God in me. I'll tell you that I didn't do it anymore. <laughs> He 
still rolls out of bed at four Though he don't have to anymore Checks the water and the wind Like he was on the job again And he returns and she's awake With all those damn pills to take Even so they make the most Of coffee and a piece of toast And somewhere she knows Exactly where his mind goes On the water, on the trails This time of day it never fails Then again he's out the door For a paper at the store Takes a turn around the dock If no one's there, he'll skip a rock When he returns, he'll watch her bake An apple crisp or coffee cake Find her hand around his wrist On his forehead, find a kiss And somewhere she knows Exactly where his mind goes On the water, on the trails This time of day it never fails Old main guy There's so much inside the old main guy And it's in his eyes that somewhere he knows No matter where his mind goes Everything is safe beside the old main guide Five o'clock, they make the rounds See the changes in the town Spot an old familiar face Another time, another place But somewhere she knows Exactly where his mind goes On the water, down the trails this time of day it never fails Old main guy There's so much inside the old main guy Almost never cries Cause somewhere he knows No matter where his mind goes Everything safe beside the old main guide He still rolls out of bed at four Though he don't have to anymore Checks the water and the wind Like he was on the job again Well, I think the community as a whole, I mean, growing up, all the adults looked after us. We could run all over the town. We had the run of the mill, you know, to speak. Uh, they all looked after us. You'd go into the pine tree store and they'd be on the liar's bench and telling stories. And, they would, and we'd always go in because they teased us. And we always liked to get teased and whatnot. So uh, you could go to anybody's house. And we all got cookies or whatever, brownies and whoopie pies all over town. So you knew where to go to get something to eat. And the whole town basically looked after the kids. And, the, and they were a close-knit community. I know, uh, you know, uh, that uh, one thing that my mother taught school and when we got out at, 
school break, we'd go to camp for uh, the whole three months. And so that's why I guess I'm a camp rat now because we grew up, uh, no running water, you had gas lights and, and gas stove and you played cribbage and cards and stuff like that. And, and so it just instilled that kind of life into me. So it's an enjoyment to come back here and be able to do that stuff growing up because it was, it was basically your innocent years that it was carefree. And uh, you didn't have the rat race and all the traffic. Like I said before, you know, you could play in the streets here and ride your bikes and, and it, was, it was that kind of town that everybody looked after you. Tell me about the Liar's Bridge. Why is it called the Liar's Bridge? <laughs> well, that's, it's just the stories told there, uh, you know, with the different adults that was there, you know, uh, Val Moore and uh, uh, Ollie White and uh, Eddie Chambers and, you know, that group there would always be sitting on their bench talking and whatnot and telling stories. So they called it the Liar's Bench and uh, it was always comical to go in there, but uh, we oh, really God. enjoyed listening to their stories. Yeah. yeah. I can remember one time we were down behind Paul Hoare's store, the Pine Tree store, and we were playing. It was Frank Bagley, Jim Williams, my brother and I, Chuck, and uh, got in a hornet's nest, a real bad one. I don't know if we were putting the rocks to it or whatever, but uh, it got onto us real bad. And, and of course, I could run pretty good, so I beat feet and Chuck beat feet. But Frank and Jimmy was just getting stung galore. So we run up around the front, and I know that it was, it was the same guys, Val Moore and a bunch of them sitting there out front, and they took those kids and, and took all the shirt and stuff and T-shirt right off them, you know, and whacking the, and got the, you know, hornets right off them. It, uh, <laughs> it was kind of comical now, but not at the time. My name is Kathy Militia. I am the first assessor in town. Um, I've lived here full time for about eight years. Uh, started as a summer person. Um, and I don't usually go around saying that I'm the first assessor. Um, but I, like I said before, I think it's relevant that I've only lived here eight years and the town has accepted me to the point where they've drafted me into a governing <laughs> body and um, it just, it feels right. Um, and it shows that once people accept you here, you belong here and you are th theirs. And that's the way I feel now, you know, I belong here. Um, I think it's, I, I don't know that I could describe it. Um, that cabin itself is very close to the stream and you can hear the water running. So I, would, I wouldn't even sleep in the bedroom. I slept out on the day bed so that I could listen to the stream. And that to me was perfect. That and the fact that the camp owners that we stayed with are very welcoming people. They make you feel like family and they're also from New Jersey, so maybe that counts. Um, but my husband and I used to um, joke with each other that this town is like Mayberry, the Andy Griffith show. Um, and it is, it is. It's like a step back in time, the way people are close to each other. It's more like a family and in good ways and bad. Um, you know, we fight like family, saying bad things. And then, you know, as soon as you sense that somebody needs something, it doesn't matter what you don't like about them. You're right there. And that's the way people have been with me also. So um, it's, it's home. You know, there, there's just a, a feeling of, belonging for me here that I never had anywhere else. Even in New Jersey, growing up and raising a family, I never felt this way. Um, it's safe, it's comforting, it's, it's home. It's, I, don't, I don't know that I could really um, explain it. Um, 
And my husband felt the same way. It was that first visit. We had been plenty of other places for fishing vacations. We like to fish. And um, besides the great fishing here, uh, it was just the feeling that you got from the town. And before we moved up here, uh, we used to call ourselves the wannabes. And we would make a little banner and walk at the end of the 4th of July parade and put on the bottom, the wannabes. And uh, eventually, the wannabes became, here we are. So um, you just have to, you know, I think if you want to fit in to something and you don't want to come and change the whole um, town, you can find a place to fit in and be accepted and find your place here and be home. It's not hard. Uh, Cindy, I think that the fact that we're in such a small town and everybody knows everybody and in growing up here was such a great opportunity. I was lucky enough, I, I almost consider I started my career working at Weatherby's. I was the cabin boy, chore boy up at Weatherby's for a number of years. I remember first going up there as a little kid, working for Bev, pulling weeds out of his gardens. And I was like nine or 10 years old and I might work my way up to be the cabin boy. I learned how to drive a car up the Weatherby's, driving his old, I think it was a 52 green DeSoto with, a, with a, on the col column, shift on the column. People don't know what that is. Uh, and I could drive that. I, leave, I just drove it around, you know, pulling canoes out to the lakes and different things like that. I was maybe 14, 15. Didn't have my license yet. So when I finally got my license, I got hired on as the chore boy. And I did it a number of times. The other great thing about being at Weatherby's, Weatherby's hired university gir you girls from the University of Maine to come down and work as the waitresses and stuff. And I was lucky enough um, to meet my wife there. And so that goes on for my life and stuff. So it worked out well, and I'm still married, and we're looking at 48 years this year, and it's what a terrific, um, I don't know how blessed, how I'm so blessed to have such a uh, beautiful wife and that stuff. Uh, other things that I learned from this town, too, is going uh, out through my career. And when I graduated from high school, I did a couple of years at Beale College, then I joined the Navy, and uh, got to do the job I wanted to do as an air traffic controller. I was enlisted, and I was fortunate enough that I went through my career or excuse me, and that first enlistment and stuff, to learn, you know, the things you learn back when you were a kid, working together, compromising, learning your different values and things, how it applies to a lot of stuff that you do out in life. And it doesn't matter, you know, if you're in Pensacola, Florida, or out, in, out at sea in a ship or something. You got to work together, you're a team, and make things work. I was very lucky, too, in the Navy, and I give credit to this little school, and Mrs. Kelligan and all the teaching she did, is keep your eyes open to opportunities. Don't get tunnel vision. And because of that, I took advantage of a lot of the programs in the Navy, and I was lucky enough to get a commission and become an officer. And I got to do, I did 22 years plus in the Navy. I retired um, on a Friday, and lucky enough, I went to work as a civilian on Monday in the Department of Defense and did another career. And all of those, I give credit to where you come from and what you learn and take advantage of and how you learn things and be open-minded. Uh, the other thing you learn about this town is <laughs> you do get your values and things, and then you learn everybody's perspective on things. This town has a great reputation of being aware of just the area itself, and that I mean the conservation, our environment. You know, we've always had the fish hatchery in town, always pro on keeping that up. Life in this town, its livelihood has been fishing and hunting. My dad, Morris's dad, all of our dads were guides and that was their livelihood. And those guys, they would work for like 17 bucks a day and had to supply everything. And it, and it wasn't because they didn't take that job because that was their career and they're gonna make a lot of money of it. They did it because they loved being outside. And what they brought to, to this town, the people that came in, the sports as we'd call them, uh, what they got to see in this town. A lot of times they got to see more than we did as kids. But, you know, there's all this part of our history that comes up. Now, uh, I'm fortunate when I come back home, all those feelings come in. From the time, you know, you come across Route 9, you're driving up through Woodland and Princeton, and, you know, to the time you turn off Route 1 and you head on the Grand Lake Road and you hit Musquash, that's when it kind of feels like, ah, I'm home. And 
feels like that all the time. And I get emotional about it. And, you know, that's how it is. Because I realize all those old folks I knew, all those old guides, you know, the Valmores and the Walter Browns and the Leslie Browns and Ollie Whites, they're all gone. And that's a tradition that's gone on. And you're not seeing that quite anymore. But what it is, it's in your heart, it's in your brain, so it'll always be there. And so, yeah, so that's a very special place for me. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for watching this film, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, my name is Morris Brown from Bangor, and I, I was born and raised in Grand Lake Stream in the 50s and 60s, and what a special place. It was really fun coming back and doing this film. I hope everybody enjoys it. Uh, I'd like to thank, to take the opportunity, I mean, to thank uh, Down East Lake Land Trust for allowing me to use a lot of the video clips in this uh, film. Um, I just thank you very much and I hope people uh, have a chance, they have a chance to look at on my site and you'll also see some other Downing Lake Land Trust uh, videos. It's really, it's really it's nice, it's really well done. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the following people, uh, Bernie Kelligan, Kathy Militia, Jimmy Williams, Jack Perkins, Ken Sprague, Nancy Betts, and Lorraine, Elaine Berger. I'd like to thank you for putting your time in and helping me uh, do this film. And i especially like to thank uh, for you showing me the museum. The historical museum is very beautiful and I was very, very impressed. And it brought back, uh, it was very emotional seeing all the guides on the wall uh, that you have in that gallery. And uh, I hope people that haven't seen the, the Historical Society Museum get a chance to go see it. It really will be worth your time. History is history and uh, you can't replace that. Um, I think that's about it except for, I like to, the people that are going to be out there in uh, Las Vegas, uh, Jonathan Perkins and Ann Dolan down in Florida and a few others out there that have been waiting to see this uh, Grand Lake Stream. Uh, they've been there in the life and it just brings back memories when they see any video of Grand Lake Stream. Um, I'd like to dedicate this to my sister, my late sister Laura Lane Brown, uh, who was a uh, select, select person in Grand Lake, assessor, I guess you call it first assessor for years. Um, she loved that town and uh, I just want to dedicate this to her. Thank you very much for everything and I hope you enjoy this. Bye. And everything is green and blue And everybody smiles at you And son, I think we'll stay a few more days I never want to leave this place one road in and one road out A different life to dream about That grown-up heart can't seem To say goodbye to Grand Lake Stream Slow. Wife knows the way to go He's fooling with a fishing line Until he smells that pine And everything is green and blue And everybody smiles at you She's hoping he can stay a few more days He'll never leave this place With one road in and no way out It's all he ever dreamed about That man could never see.